and it's good to see you. And uh, for some reason, my series of messages that I had planned for uh, March and April kind of got postponed. And uh, I was able to take you, if you want to look at this yellow sheet, I was able to take you through the first four messages that I had planned to share. And then I had my uh, heart problem. And what I would, what I was, when I was praying and thinking about how should we get back into studying God's Word together, I felt, you know, this is important stuff. I believe that God wants to speak to us through this series. So I'm going to continue it. So we are on number five. I've taken you through Jesus is the substitute lamb, the sacrifice lamb, the suffering lamb, the saving lamb. So this morning we are in number five. Jesus is, on, is the spotless lamb. He cleanses our hearts. I don't know how many of you men were uh, here yesterday morning, but uh, when I saw our guest speaker and he stood up to speak and he announced his text was 1 Peter, I said, Lord, make it be anything other than 1 Peter chapter 1. He said, 1 Peter chapter 1, and I said, Lord, not, verse, not verses 13 to 21. And he said, verses 18 and 19. And I said, oh my, I won't have anything to preach tomorrow because uh, he will take care of it. Well, he did read the text, but he shared more of a testimony. So I would like to share with you uh, more of a uh, study of the Word of God this morning. So 1 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 13. Let's read God's Word together. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a Father who judges each man's work impartially, Live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb, there's our lamb statement, a lamb without blemish, or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, so your faith and hope are in God. Dear Lord, we thank you for this text. We pray that as we look at it together, you will make it real to us and that you will help us to be holy as you are holy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Jesus is the spotless lamb. Spotless speaks of purity. If you have a white sheet and you uh, hang that white sheet out to dry after you've washed it and made it white, and uh, as it's hanging out to dry on a Maybe we don't even remember this on a clothesline. <laughs> uh, uh, as you hang it out to dry on a clothesline, and the water drips on the bottom, uh, if a dog, and my dog would do this, if a dog would run underneath and splash in a puddle, how many spots would it take to get on that clean cloth? How many spots? would make it impure. One. Just one. And God is, is looking for a spotless lamb. 
Jesus never sinned. Jesus never did anything wrong. And this is the challenge to you and me. He wants to have total control of our lives and enter into our hearts so that he can make, work, working through us, he can make us just as pure as he is. Isn't that incredible? Why should we be holy? I have three questions this morning. Why should we be holy? Verses 13 to 17. The first answer I come up with is that we should be holy because Jesus Christ is coming. Do you see what it says there in verse 13? It says, set your hope fully on the grace to be given when Jesus Christ is revealed. So God wants us to be holy and there is a time limit. Jesus Christ is coming again. I don't know when Jesus is coming again, but I do know one thing, he's coming soon. And the New Testament tells us that he's coming soon. So he is coming 2,000 years sooner, or his coming is 2,000 years closer than it was when the New Testament said it. The text begins, verse 13, with prepare your minds for action. In the King James, it says, gird up the loins of your mind. And the reason I quoted that text from the King James translation is because it gives us a picture of what it means. What, what this, these words mean. Back in Jesus' day, the men wore long flowing robes. And when a man wore long flowing robes, it was difficult for them to run. Not because they physically couldn't run, but because the robes got in their way. So in, in order for a man to run, he would pick up the robes and he would tie it up around himself kind of like a girdle, and, and uh, tightly around himself, and then his legs had the freedom to, to run, and that was girding up his loins. So when Peter says to these people, gird up the loins of your mind, he is talking about being prepared to act, to run, to be involved in activity. So, in other words, get ready for action. When, Jesus, when we know that Jesus is coming, we don't just sit around and say, oh well, we'll wait till he comes. No. When you know that Jesus Christ is coming, you get ready for action because we only have a few days to occupy till he comes. We want to live lives that show our love for Jesus. Not only do we need to get ready for action, we need to keep ourselves under control. Be self-controlled. Do you know what it's like to fly off the handle? When you fly off the handle, you lose all credibility with everybody around you. You lose the, the sanity of your own life. And when you fly off the handle, what you do and what you say could likely hurt somebody. We don't want people to be flying off the handle. We want people who are self-controlled, who self-control as a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Somebody who knows what God wants them to do and is deliberate in doing that for His glory. So we are ready for action, we're self-controlled, and we rely on the grace of God that is coming with Jesus Christ. So the first reason we should be holy is Jesus Christ is coming. Do you believe that Jesus is coming? He's coming. So we should be holy. What does it mean to be holy? It means to be set aside, to be set apart, to be different, than the rest of the world. The rest of the world 
thinks it's okay to lie, but because Jesus Christ is truth, we speak truth. The rest of the world thinks it's okay to be impure, but because Jesus Christ is pure, we have pure minds and thoughts. That's what it means to be holy. So not, number one, we should be holy because Jesus is coming. Number two, we should be holy because God is our Father. This, do you see what it says in verse 16 or 14? We are obedient, we want to be obedient children. Do you know it's a lot nicer to be an obedient child than a disobedient one, isn't it? Because when you're a disobedient child, you're always worried about when the Father's going to find you, and what He's going to say, and what He's going to do. But it says here in the text, as obedient children, do not, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Before you knew Jesus Christ as your Savior, before you were a child of God, you lived in ignorance. You didn't know the difference between right and wrong. You didn't understand what the importance of living a life for God. But now you do. And because you do, you need to live your life to glorify God and to make Him proud of you as your dad. Wouldn't it be nice if you as a child of God knew that God would welcome you into His eternal home and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy master. That's the joy and the thrill of being an obedient child. And because we want to be obedient, we want to be like him. Verse 15, it says, Why should we be holy? Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. So the motivation for purity in our lives is not because we think we're going to make ourselves better than everybody else. No, the motivation for purity in our lives is because we want to be like our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> so why should we be holy? Because Jesus Christ is coming. Because God is our Father. And number three, because, or the third thought is, because God is our judge. Look at verse 17. Since you call on a Father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Do you realize that God is an impartial <coughs> judge? We don't like to think of God as judge, do we? It kind of makes us feel uncomfortable. But God is an impartial judge, and God being an impartial judge will give us the, the judgment that we deserve. And what do we deserve? Well, technically, we are all sinners. And we deserve God's judgment, don't we? But because of Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven of that sin and brought, made pure before Him. And He says, we live our lives as strangers here on earth. Why? Because we are, we are strangers because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. When Jesus Christ saved us, we are no longer like the rest of the world. And when we realize we're different than the rest of the world, we live our lives as strangers here in reverent fear. One thing I want us to think about is we sometimes lose the, the concept of the fear or reverence for God. 
I have noticed that many times we can walk into church so casually and we can talk to our friends and we can be on our phones and we can do all kinds of things and we can lose the reverence for God that we need. But not only is reverence for God as we worship together, but reverence for God should show in our everyday lives. We call on God as Father. He judges everyone's work impartially. And we live as strangers here in reverent fear. So, why should we be holy? Because Jesus Christ is coming, because God is our Father, and God is our judge. Second question, how were we made holy? Look at verses 18 and 19. This is what we talked about, or we heard about a little bit uh, yesterday. How were we made holy? Verse 18 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you were redeemed from an empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Nothing perishable was able to make us holy. Now when I read this passage, it makes me think a little bit, because when I think of perishable things, I remember the days when we used to give out food at Baptist Temple. And uh, there were some things that could last in the fridge, there were some things that could last in the freezer, but there were some things that were fresh fruit and they didn't really want us to freeze them or even have them in the fridge. They just wanted the, us to have them in a cool storage space. But very often between Thursday when we picked up the food and Saturday when the food had to be lit, delivered, this food was so perishable that some of it went bad. And so I think of, you know, a short shelf life, four days, perishable things. But I want you to notice what Peter talks about here. He's not talking about the short kind of shelf life that I think about food. He's talking about perishable things like silver and gold. Wait a minute here. <laughs> silver and gold last a fair bit. This gold ring is my wedding ring, and it's lasted almost 25 years. It's lasted a long time. But do you know what? Compared to eternity, silver and gold have short shelf life. And we were not saved by something perishable like silver and gold. What is more valuable than silver and gold? Well, let's keep on looking here. So nothing perishable, nothing traditional. Look at the last part of verse 18. We were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down by our forefathers. In other words, our forefathers had their traditions. We were in Egypt for, for many years. The people of Israel were in Egypt for many years. And for hundreds of years, they had ways of doing things and traditions. And they kept on doing them all the same way, all the time. And they were empty because they didn't have a way of connecting with their God until the Exodus. And when the Exodus happened, God gave them a way of remembering. And do you remember what it was? Through the blood of the Lamb that was on their doorposts. And that was a symbol of their salvation and their relationship with God for the rest of their lives. We were redeemed. We were bought out of an empty, formal, way of life that was handed down to our forefathers, we are not redeemed by anything perishable and we are not redeemed by anything traditional. What are we redeemed by? 
by something exceptional, verse 19, we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is more valuable than silver, more lasting than silver, more eternal than silver or gold. We were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, and he was a lamb without blemish. Let me take you quickly through some Old Testament facts. In Exodus, the requirement is stated, the animals you choose must be year old males without defect. You may take them from the sheep or the goats. That's in Exodus 12, verse 5. In Leviticus, the requirement for the lamb or sacrificial animal was to be without defect, and it is repeated in Leviticus 19 times, those words, without defect, without defect, without defect. It's almost as if God was trying to make something clear. You don't give to me or sacrifice to me animals that were kind of, well, they're broken anyway, that, that sacrifice those animals. You sacrifice an animal without defect. And not only was it stated in Exodus and emphasized in Leviticus, it's also emphasized in Numbers. The requirement for the lamb or sacrificial animal to be without defect is repeated at least 19 times in Numbers as well. So you can see the emphasis over and over and over again. Make sure when you offer a sacrifice to God, it's not junk. Make sure it's the best you have. Make sure it is without defect. And when a sacrifice was made for the payment of your sin and mine, when a sacrifice was made to make us right with God, it was through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God who was not perishable, but his blood was precious. And he was a lamb without defect. He was a lamb that was pure. <clears throat> I lay my sin on Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God. He bears them all and frees me from the accursed load. So how are we made holy? Not with anything perishable, not with anything traditional, but with something exceptional, the precious blood of Christ. My first question was, why should we be holy? Second question was, how were we made holy? Now my third question, what did Jesus go through to make us holy? Look at verse 20 and 21. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead, and glorify him, so your faith and your hope are in God. What did Jesus go through to make us holy? Number one, he was the chosen lamb. Do you remember when the exodus happened? They, each home was to choose a lamb. God chose Jesus to be the lamb of God and he chose Jesus to be the Lamb of God before the creation of the world. God knew that he was going to make mankind. God knew that mankind would sin and fall short of his glory. God loved mankind, so before anything wrong ever happened, God provided the salvation for mankind. Jesus, the pure Lamb of God, was chosen before the creation of the world. 
He was chosen. Number two, he was revealed. And I want you to notice when he was revealed. He was revealed in these last times. Do you realize that ever since Jesus Christ showed up in Bethlehem, in a manger, we have been in the last times. People say, Pastor Tim, do you believe Jesus is coming? Yes. Are we in the last days? And I say, we have been since Jesus got here. Well, we're in the last days of the last days? Well, the last days are since Jesus got here, so we've been in the last days for a long time. He was revealed in these last days for our sake because it is through Jesus Christ that we come to believe in God. You say you believe in God, but you don't believe in Jesus? You don't believe in God. You don't truly understand who God is or know who God is if you don't believe in Jesus. Because Jesus is the only way to God the Father. So Jesus was chosen, he was revealed, and then, guess what? Jesus died and he was raised from the dead. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, that was God's seal of approval of Jesus' words to the left side. It is finished. God said, yes, it's done. The payment for sin is complete. Now you can, now I'm going to raise my son from the dead and he's going to be able to offer eternal life to everyone who will put their faith and their trust in him. God chose Jesus before the creation of the world. He revealed him in his last days and he raised him from the dead and then he was glorified. When Jesus <coughs> excuse me, ascended into heaven, it was the sign that he was glorified and he sits at the right hand of the Father. Until the time comes when he returns. So, what does it mean to be holy? It means to be like Jesus. Who was Jesus? He was the spotless Lamb of God, without defect, totally pure. And guess what? God wants that for your life and mine. Total purity. Purity in the way we think. Purity in the way we act. Purity in the way we live. That's what God wants. And it's possible because we have a relationship to God through Jesus Christ, who himself is the spotless lamb. And when the spotless lamb is allowed to take over our lives, he comes into our lives and then, see, for some of us, we struggle because Jesus may be resident, but he's not president. He lives in your heart, but he's not in control of your life. When Jesus Christ is Lord, when he is totally in control of your life, then what he does is he purifies, he cleanses your heart and your life. Jesus is the spotless Lamb of God. Where are you at this morning? Have you understood who Jesus is? Have you allowed him into your life to cleanse your heart from sin? If not, you could do that today. You say, oh, Pastor Tim, how could I do that? Because Jesus died on the cross 
for you. And his blood is willing, is able to cleanse you from all of your sin, past, present, and future. If you will put yourself in the place of believing, of trusting, of accepting what he did, he did for you. So I ask you this morning, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? If you have, are you living a life where Jesus Christ is not only resident in your life, but is in control of your life, he's president? And if God is speaking to your heart about this, we have an invitation. We have a time when you can come and pray and share your need and declare that you want Christ to cleanse you and make you into the holy person that you long to be and that you need to be. We're going to sing in just a moment. Are they here? Oh, they're here. We're gonna, I'm sorry. We're going to sing in just a moment. And as we sing, I'm going to ask us to all stand. And as we stand to sing, if God is speaking to your heart, if you want Him to cleanse your, Christ to cleanse your life, this is the time to indicate that. <coughs> you can come, and I'll be standing down here willing to pray with you and for you. Let's sing together.